Throughout their history as a nation, the Israelites sought to live by the commands that God had given to Moses after they had escaped slavery in Egypt. At times, the Israelites followed the commands closely, living lives connected to God and one another. At other times, they forgot about and even ignored God's commands and lived the way they wanted to. Many of the commands were about the best ways to live, the best ways to be healthy, to get along with one another, and to survive as a nation. Other commands were about how to best worship God. This included commands about sacrifices and rituals that would help the Israelites relate to God. But some of the commands God gave were meant to help Israel remember all that God had done for them by celebrating with great feasts and parties. One of these feasts was called the Feast of Tabernacles. Every year, after the Israelites had harvested all of the produce they had planted and collected the wine from the wine presses, God instructed all of the families of Israel to hold a joyful celebration for seven full days after the harvest so that they might celebrate the work of their hands and for God to bless the harvest. This wasn't the only festival God commanded the Israelites to celebrate. At other times throughout the year, God told the Israelites to gather and celebrate and be joyful for all that God was doing and to remember what God had done in their history. Each time they gathered, everyone was expected to bring something to contribute to the feast. Depending on how much they had been blessed with in their harvest, the Israelites would bring gifts to the festival so that everyone, even those who had no money and no families of their own, could experience the joy of celebrating God's goodness together. Good morning, New Hope Community Church. How are you? I am fired up this morning after that song. Are you? Yeah. I am ready. I'm ready. Um, we have a bunch of announcements today, um, and so we're going to try to get through those. But before I get started on too many of those, um, Tim Kepler, we're going to have the privilege of hearing him speak today uh, because Pastor Tim, yes, yes, yes. Pastor Tim is in Africa with some more of our folks from New Hope. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But first, I'd like to invite Nick Delgado, our new associate pastor for young adults, He's going to speak with you about what he's getting started. Amen. First, I want to say thank you so much for having the faith to allow me to come and be part of your church family on the staff. And I promise you, I'm going to give you everything I have as well as my family. And it's going to be a privilege to serve with you until the Lord comes back. That's my, that's my goal. So, hey, real quick, I just wanted to share with you. Again, my, my role here is to pastor to the, the young marriages and the young families for now. And so if you would, if you have any interest or you want to know more about what my vision and what I, I see the Lord doing for that ministry and that group of folks here at New Hope, just indicate it. Pastor Robert's going to give you the invite to fill out your uh, communication card later. Just indicate, I just need your contact information, your name and a contact number or email, and just put the initials YM for young married or YF for young families. And then I'm just going to be in the weeks ahead putting some information together. I want to conduct and put together a, a lead team with some folks that are interested in helping me part of a leadership group. And I'm, my, one of my goals is, and maybe in the spring or maybe in the fall, put together a, uh, a retreat and some other things. So stay tuned, and I'll keep you informed. But if you would indicate that on the card in the weeks ahead as well as this morning, I'll get in contact with you. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, Nick. He's really hitting the ground running on this. Uh, we've had some time to share together, and I, I appreciate him already and his heart for God. And I'm really excited about what he's going to be doing with these young adults. I don't know if I quite fit in there, but maybe I'll sneak in once in a while just to say hello. Um, okay, other things going on. First off, uh, somebody in the last service lost a cell phone. So if you know who that is, let them know that I have it. And um, if they can tell me what it looks like, then it will be a small fee to get it back to them. Um, I have a hand right here. Is it yours? It's or you just want it to mine. be? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. Okay, all right, sweet. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir. All right, um, what else is going on here? Let's jump down to, oh, well, I'll talk about those vis visitor cards. Um, if today is your first day at New Hope Community Church, 
Um, you've picked an interesting day to be here uh, because you won't be hearing from our regular pastor. Now, that could be seen as a good thing or that could be seen as a bad thing. I'll let you decide. But either way, if you would be willing to take one of those cards in front of you, uh, depending on which direction it's facing, it's either going to be green or pink. We usually call them pink cards because uh, they used to be pink before we got into the 21st century um, and, and updated those things. But those can be used for a number of things. If you have a new address, a new email address, and uh, you'd like the church to stay apprised on that so we can keep you guys informed about what's going on at New Hope, you can use that. If you want to uh, give Nick a message uh, that you're part of that Young Families group, we highly, highly encourage you to get involved with that group. Right now is a great time to do that. Um, you know, get striking while the iron's hot. And it might be a little more difficult for you if you're timid, uh, like I can be sometimes, um, in joining a group that's already established. But if you get in right on the forefront, um, it's a great time to do that. Also, um, if you like, again, if you've never been here before and uh, you'd be willing to fill that out, we'd love to know that you're here and this was your first time here. Um, what we would really like to do is buy you a cup of coffee and find out a little more, more about who you are, but we're not going to make you do that because church folk can be kind of intimidating sometimes. Um, but instead, if you're willing to do that, we will just uh, start out by sending you stuff through the snail mail, if you will. Uh, we're not going to email you. We're not going to beat on your door. We're not going to bother you on the phone. Um, but we would like to give you some information about New Hope and help you get uh, plugged in over here. All right. Other things going on. Uh, we have a motorcycle ride coming up on the 8th. If you are on a motorcycle of any type, um, this is not one of those uh, inner circle clicks where uh, you're not invited if you don't have a particular horsepower. Or And I say that because my bike is like 30 horsepower. So um, it's, it's on the low end of, of the spectrum. Um, but hey, everybody's welcome. Everybody's invited. We're going to have a good time. We're going to roll out to uh, Bravo Farms and eat cheese and do whatever Christians do, I guess. Um, probably get a cup of Christian crack at Starbucks. Um, yeah, so that'll be a good time. Uh, make sure that you plug in for that. What else is here? The we have. Right there. I'm sorry. The clipboard. It's right there. Yeah, I've got one of those. I'll get there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chick. You know, Chick Passarella. Everybody, I asked him once if um, his wife had ever tell, told anybody that they couldn't make it to the engagement she was invited to because she had a, a hot, she had a date with a hot chick. And <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Oh, yes, I am cheesy. Thank you. I'll be here all night. Um, by the way, do you know how God keeps the ocean clean? Tide. Thank you. Thank you. A little late on that one. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, Mexico meeting after uh, church today. It's uh, 1215 right here in the bridge. It's right after church. Um, it's not an official meeting, but if you have any interest in going on a short-term mission trip, um, it is a youth-oriented Excuse me. My mouth is getting dry. I talk too much. It is a youth-oriented trip, but we encourage everybody to go. Okay, we want anybody who has interest in short-term missions. We do believe that um, if you have not been on a short-term mission trip before, once you have... Your eyes will be opened in a lot of ways um, in the area of what missions look like, not because short-term missions are a parallel, um, but they do help us see some of what missionaries have to go through. And it really has inspired me personally, um, not only in watching youth's lights turn on for Jesus, um, but also personally as, as a way of, of understanding missions better and turning my heart towards um, giving and understanding when they're speaking to us. So anyway, I highly encourage you to do that. If you have any questions, by coming to this meeting, you're not saying that you are going to Mexico, just that you want to know more about it, either for yourself, for your kids, for your grandkids, etc. Women's road trip coming up. Uh, I'm told that it's a highly spiritual trip. That's what Tim says, yeah. Uh, they're going to be going to Gilroy, is it? And um, looking for Jesus at the shopping mall, I'm sure. <laughs> They will find him. Also on this uh, pink slip. Today is the last chance to, to get your tickets for that. Um, where do the tickets get them into the casino? or? Oh, on the bus. Oh, that'll be fun. You guys are going to take a bus. Okay, so get your tickets outside today. Uh, it's the last day to do that. Also, I um, want to remind you about small groups, as we always do around here. New Hope Community Church uh, has been a big supporter of small groups now. We're finding that uh, God touches people 
through each other um, in a lot of ways that he can't do from behind a pulpit, you understand. Uh, we reach into each other's lives, and uh, that, can, that can be a little awkward at first because Christians get deep really fast. Um, but I promise you, I promise you it will be worth your time. Um, you'll develop friends, lifelong friends. And uh, the type that, I always say that friends are the, are the people who show up on moving day. Do you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, I always know who my friends are when I have to move. Um, <laughs> but those are the types that you will meet in these small groups. So talk with uh, Corey Gallardo, uh, James Gallardo, um, Teddy Miller, or Christy Miller regarding that if you're not already plugged in to a small group. Also, you can fill that out on one of those pink slash green cards. All right, um, I want to talk about Tim a little bit and uh, the folks. There's eight folks from New Hope that have traveled to uh, Africa. They left Friday. Um, as I'm told, they've been on a couple of planes, and they should be landing today at some point, getting on a long, long, dusty bus ride loaded with luggage and chickens and such like that. Um, so that should be interesting. Look forward to pictures from them via uh, Facebook and things like that. But be remembering to pray for them. Uh, they're with the 1040i initiative. They um, are in Darapo, which is a city in Ivory Coast, with 40 other volunteers, doctors, nurses, construction workers, teachers. They'll be ministering to over 200 children through Vacation Bible School. Uh, they're building a dormitory that should be completed and furnished with beds. Um, they have quilts that were brought from New Hope. Uh, women here that have sewed those things together. There's over 30 of them. They're anticipating over 100 surgeries performed by um, performed, and nearly 1,000 patients will be seen for health purposes. A lot of those are vaccinations that, um, you know, here they cost like 98 cents, and still that's too much for the budget of a lot of people in Africa. And so um, it's a great, great work that they're doing, and uh, we need to be remembering to pray for them, for those who will uh, be ministered by them, that not only will their health uh, be restored, but their health to Jesus and their spirit would be restored mm -hmm. as well. Amen? Um, there is in the bulletin, in your first page of the bulletin, that's more than just pictures, if you didn't know. Um, so inside here, there's a prayer list. If, uh, if you're just wondering, you know, what can I be praying for for the folks in Africa? There's a list of things that, because uh, they do covet your prayers. Okay. Well, at that time, or this time, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward. I assume that we have some as we prepare to pray and receive our morning tithes and offering. Yes, sir. Homeless outreach at 1230 today. If, um, if you are interested in Mexico then, and you also want to go to the homeless outreach, please go to the homeless outreach and I can make an, a coffee appointment with you later and get you connected for Mexico. Yes? Hey, Robert? Yeah. Um, just, uh, just a little note on the, uh, on the trip to Gilroy. Hey, guys, 45 bucks per ticket for your wife. <laughs> and you got to keep on flying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure that just happened, like right now. That, that did just happen, didn't it? Okay. All right, will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, today is interesting for me. It's different. And I sense a certain energy in the air, maybe just because I'm out of my comfort zone. But Lord, I find that in uh, times like these where I am out of my comfort zone, or Lord, as you put me through trials, as you have my brothers and sisters all here together in your name. That those are the times where, Jesus, you touch our hearts and you inspire courage and change. That, Lord, you promote love. And it always, always comes from you, but it isn't always easy. I thank you in advance, God, for what you're going to do in our hearts this morning. I thank you, God, that as we call upon your name, even right now, Jesus, that you hear us. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are, God. 
I know that I'll never be good enough. But in your grace, you've told me that I already am, that we are together. And Jesus, as we sing to you, I pray that that you would hear the melody of our hearts and that you would be lifted up and glorified. That Jesus, our worship to you this morning as we sing and as we listen would be a pleasing aroma to you. Jesus, I pray for those in need, those who are here today and those who are not, for those needs that we know, Jesus, and those that only you know. I pray for those that are facing cancer, that, Lord, are in financial struggles, that, Lord, sit this morning with their marriage in jeopardy, those relationships that have been tattered, God, that I know you so much want to restore. God, I pray for Mariah and the kids and their struggles for medical reasons, God, and I pray for Tim Kepler as he preaches to us today. God, may we have just soft hearts ready to hear, Lord. May we think with critical minds. May we leave here at least wondering if what he has to say is true, if not accepting and applying. I pray for my brother who I met just a few days ago, who's so far down on his luck, God, that he has nowhere to look but to you. And I pray, Jesus, by your grace, you would restore his, his hope, that he would find a new hope, God, not here, not through me or any one of us, God, but through you, because of you, and that he would look to you from this day forward, because you are his hope. And if any way, God, we can help in that process without getting in your way, I pray that you would find willing servants to do that, and on all needs, God, the need of those who are sitting next to us, I pray that you would warm our hearts, that we would hear their silent cries for help, and that, Jesus, we would love on them. I pray for the tithes and the money that we're about to receive, Lord. May it be used for your glory, and may it be used above reproach. We love you, Jesus. We say in your name, amen. Am I doing it right, Milo? Check, check, check. Is it on? Check, one, two, 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 all right. I am really happy and blessed to be here with you this morning. Pastor Tim asked me if I would come and share the word, and I'm like, I don't know if I can live up to you, Pastor, but I'll do my best. I really respect and honor Pastor Tim. I've had a little bit of time to spend some time with him. He took me fishing, uh, myself, his dad, and him, and we went out to the lake, and we spent the day on the lake fishing for trout, and I had just a great, great time, even though he caught more fish than I did. Uh, I still still respect him and thank him for sharing and spending that time with me. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the Word this morning, and the theme of the message this morning is on joy. How many of us would like more joy in our life? I know that's me. I would like to have more joy in my life. But you know the enemy is always ripping and tearing away at our joy and at our peace in order to rob us of our joy and still us of our joy. You see, because when we have joy, we become a light to him. And other people are attracted to joy when they see it in our face and in our life it attracts people it opens up windows of opportunity to share the love of Christ so God wants us to have continuous joy not just a moment of joy but to dwell in him and have continuous joy and that is something that is can be very challenging to do in our daily walk is to have continual joy in Christ so today we're going to study a little bit the scriptures on how we can maintain and have continuous joy in our life. Psalms 91 says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise 
unto the rock of our salvation. John 15 and 11 says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You see, I want to have complete joy. And like I said earlier, it's not always easy to walk in complete joy. But I found that there are some methods that we can do, that we can adapt, that we can incorporate into our lives that can help us maintain and have complete joy. We all know someone that no matter how amazing life gets, the potential for doom remains the focus. Remember Eeyore in the Winnie of the Pooh books. Yes, I love cartoons. I'm exposed. Nothing better than a bowl of Captain Crunch and Tom and Jerry on a Saturday morning when it's raining. <laughs> I'm a big kid at heart, and I do love cartoons. Remember Eeyore in the Winnie of the Pooh books. Among his token responses are, thanks for noticing me. And if it's a good morning, which I doubt, often spoken in a drawn-out manner with a hint of disgust. Keeping with the Winnie of the Pooh theme, joy isn't necessarily acting like Tigger either. How many of us remember Tigger? What does Tigger do? He bounce. Bouncing through life in ignorance without a care in the world isn't a proper picture of a biblical joy. The key question, the key question is, what is it that gives us true happiness and contentment in life? What is it that gives me true happiness and contentment in life? What is it that gives you true contentment and happiness in life? The first order of business is to identify the difference between joy and and happiness, because there is a significant difference between joy and happiness. For many people today, being happy is fully dependent on whether life is all good. If someone asks, rate your life right now on a scale from 1 to 10, often the number given is based on the number of problems present in your life or in my life. If someone were to ask you to rate your life right now on a scale from 1 to 10, often the number given is based on the number of problems present in our life. Happiness slides up and down the scale based on the perception of negative issues going on at the time. Problems rise, what happens? Happiness goes down. So problems rise, happiness goes down. Troubles begin to go away, what happens to the happy scale? It goes up. The happy scale starts to climb. Joy, however, is not dependent on our circumstances. And in fact, joy, ironically, can become strongest when troubles come. That should also read, joy should become strongest when troubles come. Why do you think that is, church? Because you see, I've gone through some troubles in my life, but I choose to go through those troubles with joy. It's not always easy, but it should always be our focus and our goal. Can someone please look up, oh, Psalms 30 and 5. We're going to go to Psalms 30 and 5. And it says, for his anger, his anger endures, but for a moment in his favor is life. This is the part that I love. Weeping may endure for a night, but what cometh in the morning? Joy. Weepeth may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. When I read that scripture, I kind of stopped there for a minute. I'm like, okay, God, weeping may endure. So you're, you're saying it's okay. We're going to be angry for a while. Weeping may endure, endure for a night. Morning, who, who has an idea of what time night starts? Give me a time. Is, there's no right answer to this. What time does night start? What time is that? Five o'clock? Any, any other ideas? Seven, seven o'clock. Okay, let's go with seven o'clock. So if we may endure for a night, night starts at seven o'clock, but joy comes in the morning. What time does a.m. start? 12.01, right? <laughs> so we don't have much time to be sad, right? We got from seven o'clock to 12.01, okay? And that joy that joy scale's got to start tipping. So I think what God is really trying to communicate to us in the scriptures is that he doesn't expect us to sit in our anger or in our, our hurts for very long. He knows they're going to come, but he's saying joy is coming in the morning. We have to condition ourselves to run, to have a path honed out where we can say, I'm going through this or I'm going through that. I've got financial struggles. My car's breaking down, but you know what? I got to get to Jesus because if I get to Jesus, I can keep my joy level high. 
James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I love that scripture. Consider it pure joys, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing, I, th I said to myself, what is a test? Well, when you're in school, you have a test. Teacher gives you a test. You hope you get a good grade on the test so that you can pass the class, so that you can graduate, you can get a good job, you can make money, you can take care of yourself, you can take care of your family, and that all your needs will be met so you're not lacking anything. Well, what is God really saying to us here? He's saying that when we go through those trials, that it's a test, and that he wants us to pass the test so that we can mature in our faith, we can mature in our growth. The psalmist reminds us of the reality of joy that comes when we rest in God's presence. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The key idea here is, despite my circumstances, I feel inner contentment and understand my purpose in life. Joy has more to do with remaining in the presence of Jesus than with avoiding problems and struggles in our lives. Going back to John 15, we know that joy is always available to us when we remain in Christ. I want to tell a story of a good friend of mine. He's a pastor. He likes to live way out where no, like kind of like Star Trek, where no men has voyaged before. He lives in the middle of nowhere, but he likes it like that. He likes the solitude. He lives at the base of a mountain. He likes to go up to the mountain. He likes to pray. He likes to be alone. He likes to spend time with God. And he's got this big, immaculate lawn. It's so big, he has to cut it with a tractor. Is, will you help me with this, Mila? It's, it's kind of bothering me a little bit here. There we go. Oh, that's awesome. So he has this big lawn that's very well manicured, very well groomed, and he's got a tractor that he rides on this lawn. And to say, what I'm trying to say is he knows every inch of his lawn, okay? So he also has this big balcony where he likes to sit out and he likes to read and commune with God and, and study and everything. And, and one day it had rained and he went out and he's sitting out on his lawn and he's reading and he noticed that there was this ravine in his lawn that went from the house all the way out to the fence and it was full of water. And he thought, oh, that's strange. I don't, I don't remember that being there before. Hmm. He never noticed it because it hadn't really rained much. So he kind of forgot about it. And then one day he was out reading on his balcony, and he's got three big dogs. And he noticed his dogs, whenever someone would come up the driveway, because there's a couple other houses up there, the dogs would start out on that path, and they would run from the house all the way to the fence. And he started to notice over time that every single time the dogs did it, they ran on the same path. So he started to think, that's where that ravine came from. And he came up with this. He said, you know, Tim, I've learned something from those dogs of mine. Because you see, if we as people would start out on a path every time we have troubles or storms in our life, and we would learn, condition ourselves to stay on the same path, that same rut, that same ravine, and he said, you know what? Just like the rain filled up that, that ditch with water, God wants to fill it up with water so that every time we run to him through that, we get cleansed and we get washed. And I thought, wow, that's really awesome. Just like those dogs, you guys, if we, we have to run to Jesus. We have to condition ourselves that when those problems come in our lives, no matter what they might be, that the, our first thought is run to Jesus. You remember that commercial that was, I could have had a V8. <laughs> oh, well, that's me. That's me because there's been so many times where I've gone through things and it's been a day, a week, a month, and it's like, Jesus. You know? So we just got to condition ourselves to automatically think, I got to run to God.
Through whatever life brings, let these statements guide you to see how true joy differs from mere happiness. Happiness is a state of mind, while joy is a mind set. Happiness comes and goes, while joy can be constant. Happiness is dependent, while joy is independent. Happiness is conditional, while joy is unconditional. The Apostle Paul had learned the secret to joy found in Jesus. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whether the circumstances I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Jesus drives home, James drives home the definition of joy in the kingdom of God as having nothing to do with eliminating negative outward circumstances, but rather with embarrass, embracing them as opportunities to strengthen faith and gain resolve. Consider it pure joys, my brother and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Note the end result of choosing eternal joy, being mature and complete in Christ. Joy becomes the fuel for the believer to carry on this road to maturity. Only Jesus can make our lives flourish in the midst of trouble. Joy is strengthened when life is challenging. Joy is strengthened when life is challenging. You see, I've gone through some challenging things in my life, and I like to share a story that I, of some things that I went through in my life. My wife had a dream of always having horse property. And then about 12 years ago, um, she, we were taking the kids to basketball practice, and there was a sign that said horse property, and she just decided to go and look at it. So she came home after dropping the kids off and said, oh, look, come look at this little house I saw. Oh, I love it. Da, 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 da. So I thought, oh, okay. So I went and I looked at the house, and then we looked at it. Oh, no, yeah, that's nice. Mm, yeah, that's, that's good. And then I went home, and then I prayed about it because I knew her desire was always to have horse property. And I said, Lord God, can I buy that house? Uh, should I buy that house for my wife? And God said, do you want to buy that house for your wife? And I thought, ooh, that's going to be a lot of money. But yes, I do. He said, then the house is yours. I made one phone call to my banker, and I said, I found a house I'd like to buy, and I'm going to need this amount of money. And he said, done deal. You have the money. Oh. Okay, so I went back by the house, and the realtor was out there, and he was out in the front working on something. And I said, hey, uh, I'm going to buy this house. And he was like, yeah, right. <laughs> working. I said, no, I'm going to buy this house. I have the money. He's like, you have the money? I was like, yeah. Here's my banker. Call him. He called him. Yeah, Tim has the money. Da, 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 da. Long story short, bought the house. Moved in the house, raised the kids there, lived there seven years. Well, one day my wife was out feeding the horse, and she fell. She broke her ribs. And when she broke her ribs, it triggered a chain effect of health issues in her life. She got to the point where she couldn't ride anymore. She had to quit her job. I was paying the house mortgage on my own, and let me tell you, stress began to build up in my life. And I want to tell you, that was the most painful things that I had ever gone through because this was my home. This was where I raised my kids. This is where my family lived, and we put everything into that house. We fixed it up. We spent $80,000 renovating it, and I want to be totally honest with you. I was devastated. I wish I knew now, I wish I knew then what I knew now, how to run to God immediately. And the stress began to build up on me and build up on me. But then I can run to Jesus. I finally did come to that place. Even though it took me a while, I got there. And I got to the place where I gave it to Jesus. So we weren't making the payments. We started talking to the bank, and the bank said, well, we'll give you a loan mod. Send us some paperwork. Fill out the paperwork. Okay, we filled it out. A month turned into two months. Two months turned into a year. A year turned into two years. Two years turned into three and a half years. We were in the house not making any payments because that's what the bank told us to do. Well, finally, 
my wife decided one morning that she just didn't want to live there anymore because, you see, it was kind of an equestrian area, and there was a lot of dogs that lived there, and the dogs were barking and bothering her, and she's just like, I don't want to live here anymore. So we're like, oh, okay. So we called the realtor, talked to the realtor. The realtor said, well, you haven't made payments in a while, and banks aren't usually given short sales. They'd rather just foreclose and move on, da-da-da-da-da. We said, well, put the house on the market anyway. Put the house on the market. A month later, we had an offer. Uh, they sent the offer to the bank. The bank accepted it. Boom, the house was gone. Sold the house. We lived there three years, no payments. Our credit wasn't damaged. We got out of the house, okay? Now, I want to share another story with you about a friend of mine named Dave. I've known Dave for 20 years. Um, he's a plumber. I own rental property. Dave always came, and he always fixed up our rental property. Good friend of mine. Good friend. And even though I moved to Yorba Linda and he moved to Severado Canyon, we still stayed in contact with, the, with each other. He worked on my properties and we'd fellowship from time to time. Last time I saw him was about a year ago. He came and he did some work for me. And then I had, didn't hear from him for about six or seven months. And I was on tour in Japan and I was checking my voicemails. Um, and then uh, I, I picked up, I was checking my voicemails and then I got to a phone call and it was his wife. And his wife said, Tim, um, I have some bad news. Dave committed suicide. And my heart just about dropped out of my chest. I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, Ann, what happened? She said, well, Dave walked in and commit, quit his job one day, and he tried to make it on his own. He thought he could make it on his own because, see, Dave is a master plumber. And he, she said he stayed afloat for a while, but then he got behind on the house payments. And he went a whole year without paying any house notes. You see, I didn't know this. And she said, and finally one day, it was so overwhelming, he took his life. And I thought, what a tragedy. Now, I'm telling you this story because I went through the same thing that Dave went through. But the difference was I had Jesus to run to. And see, and that's why joy wants, God wants to give us joy. He wants to give us joy in our heart. Because when we have joy in our heart, we become a light for Jesus. And people see the light in us. And God can use us to win others to Christ. Many times I tried to minister to Dave, but Dave kind of had his own idea and precepts and concepts about what God was about. But the difference for me, even though I was so hurt over that situation in my life, was I had that rut, I had that vein, I had that place, I had God to run to, to give me that peace when I was going through that storm in my life. And finally, there is a source of deep joy available from an intimate place of serving Jesus. Take a look at this teaching in Mark 15, 3 through 7. Then Jesus told this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way that there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Joy comes when the lost are found, when we join Jesus in his work by sharing and seeing people come to him. We can be a part of the heavenly celebration right here and right now. Key application. What difference does it make in the way I live? What difference does it make in the way I live? The joy of Christ will replace or reduce our stress. When I sing worship to God, it gives me joy. Psalms 95 and 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Joy becomes a filter through which we view life. We're not, la we're not talking about rose-colored glasses, but about actually having brand new eyes. Joy can change our perspective and our perception of negative circumstances. We aren't simply in denial, sticking our head in the sand, but rather we choose to rise above the circumstances and adopt an eternal mindset. Stress can come from many different factors today. We can worry and fret because we feel we're not in control. In control. Joy is an ongoing reminder that God is in control, that he is in charge of the outcome. Joy comes from trusting the controller of all things. The joy of Christ will, come, will become contagious through us. As stated earlier, who doesn't want to hang out with a joyful person? Joy lifts others up just as despair brings them down. 
If you choose joy on a regular basis, you will not only be a far more approachable and relatable person, but your attitude will rub off on others and make a big impact on the, all the environments that you are in. I want to tell, tell you a story about um, Christmas. You see, I love Christmas. It's one of my favorite times of year. And one of my favorite things to do is to go get Christmas trees. And I've always gone with my boys and got Christmas trees and let them joust over which tree we're going to get. But you see, I personally have a set routine that I do every Christmas. Every Christmas that I can remember, I do the same thing. I go to, I'm happy, first of all. I'm joyful. I go to the Christmas tree lot, and the first thing I do is I go look at the noble trees. You all know what the noble trees are? Those are the beautiful, expensive trees, right? That's every year I do the same thing. I go look at the noble trees. I ask the guy how I find the most beautiful one that I'd like to get, and I ask him how much it is, and then I say, Where's the Doug Furs? <laughs> because the price this year was like $160 for the tree I wanted. And I, but every year I do the same thing. I go look at the Doug Furs, get the price, and then I, uh, no, the Nobles, and then I go look at the Doug Furs. So I, after he told me the price, I go, okay, where are the Doug Furs? And he goes, they're right over there, but I have another customer, so I'll be right back to you. He was very nice to me. So I made my way over like I always do. I'm looking at the duck first. I'm like, okay, this one is nice. I guess I'll get this one. And all of a sudden, I stop and I look down, and I'm in like four inches of mud. And I have my brand new workout shoes on, my brand new tennis shoes. So I'm like, oh, man. Well, I always keep a pair of spare of old tennis shoes in my truck, always. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go change my shoes. And I'm, when I leave that, that lot, I was going to buy a tree, okay? It wasn't going to be a noble. It was going to be a duck fur. But I was going to buy a tree. I was just going to go to my car and change my shoes. But I'm happy the whole time. Da, 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 deck the halls. Da, da, da. So I'm walking back, and this guy's sitting on a truck, and he goes, hey, brother. He's like, he's like, man, where are you going without a tree? And I look at my shoes, and I'm just going to change my shoes. I was going to go buy a tree. He's like, man, where are you going without a tree? And I'm like, uh. And before I could say anything, he goes, man, Go get any tree on that lot for $49. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I go to the car. I put on my old shoes. I went right back in the mud. And which side do you think I went on? <laughs> the noble side, right? I got the biggest tree I could fit in my house. Like a $200 probably dollar tree for $49.99. Okay? But you see, when you have the joy of, when you have God's joy in your heart, people will be nice to you for no reason. Even if they don't want to be nice to you, they will be nice to you. They will give you things. They will do nice things for you. But see, it's a countenance on our face. And I mean, I just had Christmas, Jesus, joy, just dripping all over, man. And, and I could tell you lots of stories like that that happened. So anyway, I get home with this tree, right? And I get it out of the truck. I mean, it's big. I get it. We have double doors that open up. So I just have one side because usually I can get a tree that I get through one side. This door was not going through. I had to open up both sides. And I barely got it to squeak through the door. And my wife comes and her eyes go, bing. Ooh, you bought that tree. Because she knows every year I look at those trees and I never bought you got that tree this year? And I go, yeah, let me tell you, I got it. And I told her the story, and she was like, she set the tree up early, and she took it down late, okay? She, she sent it out on Facebook. This is the best tree we've ever had. <laughs> so, you know, the joy of the Lord, when it's on our face, when it's in our life, when it's our countenance on our face, just good things happen. People want to be around people that are joyful, and God will give you favor when you have his joy on your face. Amen? The joy of Christ will draw others to you. An old saying says, you can catch more with flies than what? No, you can catch more flies with honey than what? <laughs> Vinegar, all right. Another one often heard in sports is, attitude is everything in sports setting. Attitude is everything. Person exuding a joy and vigor about life is going to raise the question, what makes him or her so different? When those around you can look at us and see that we choose to express joy no matter whether life is good or bad at the moment, 
therein lies the strongest testimony we can offer without words. Notice the path we have taken here from an inward focus of ending personal stress to an internal transformation to an outward attraction of people to Christ. As joy grows in, in the heart and mind of the believer, it inflates, infiltrates the soul and then moves outward to impact others, loving God and loving neighbor. You probably heard the word countenance before. It describes not only the look on your face, but also the look of your face. The last entry of George Orwell's notebook read, at 50, everyone has the face he deserves. Eventually, your face forms to your attitude and the perspective you have on life from the inside. You will see people who look angry, but then you realize that they're not frowning. That's a bad countenance. But have you seen a bride on her wedding day or a mother seeing her newborn child for the first time? Usually a radiant countenance. How can you tell that someone good or bad has happened? How can you tell something good or bad has happened to someone you're close to? Even before they say a word, the countenance as a Christian, even before they say a word, the countenance as a Christian matures in the virtue of joy, the countenance becomes a gauge of growth. In one of the Methodist Episcopal Church Missionary Society's yearly journals, the story appeared a Hindu trader in India asked Pima, a native, Christ, a native Christian, what do you put on the face to make it shine so? Pima asked her. I don't put anything on my face. And he said, yes, you do, said the trader. All you Christians do. I have seen it in Anga and in the Amabad and in the Surat of and in Bombay. Pima laughed and said, I'll tell you what it is that makes my face shine. It's happiness in my heart. Jesus gives me joy. We all have good and bad days. We will all experience life's ups and downs. John 16 and 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in the world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Has life robbed you of your joy? We are all growing in this virtue. What does your face reflect to others? What does your attitude communicate about your faith? Happiness will be all too fleeting, but the joy of Jesus is available to your soul right now. When trials arise, lean on him and you will find joy.